Chapter 13. Saddled. Sitting along the creek with a worm tied to the end of a three-foot length of string, Sierra waited patiently as she dangled it in front of a large crawdad. Hiding in his hole just a few feet below the water, it moved slowly out, tasting the water as the scent of the worm drifted its way. With the end looped around her finger, she gave it a little twitch to make the crawdad think it had waited too long. Each time she made it twitch, the crawdad moved farther out of its hole, and each time it appeared to become a little more excited about clamping its claws down around the worm. With the crawdad only inches away from the worm and almost out of its hole, Sierra made the twitching a little lighter. Suddenly it launched itself toward the worm and flipped its tail to drag it back into the safety of its hole. Pleased with herself, Sierra announced, Got it. Confused, Katie watched as she began slowly pulling the string from the water. How? There's no hook on the string, she said, watching as the crawdad broke the surface of the water. Sierra laughed a little at the thought of her brother, Robert. Because much like my brother, they are too stubborn to let go. Reaching over, Sierra grabbed an old coffee can she had found the day before as they were making camp for the night. Hanging the crawdad over the can, she gave the line a few good shakes, causing the crawdad to fall into the can with a piece of the worm. Sierra then scooped up water with the can to ensure it stayed alive long enough to be joined by its friends. You want to give it a try? Sierra asked Katie, who closely watched every move she made. Shaking her head, Katie replied, No, I am hungry, and you're pulling them from the water fast. I'll go build a fire. If that is okay? Katie asked watching Sierra pull another stubborn crawdad from the water and drop him in the can. Sierra looked up at Katie from beneath the brim of her hat. I'm not the boss of you. Do what you want. It would make them easier to eat, Sierra replied, before returning to search for the next crawdad. Not easily offended after being raised by a U.S. Army Ranger for a father, Katie turned and started walking back to camp, picking up small sticks and grass along the way. Entering camp... Katie could hear Carter moaning and tossing around on the ground where he had slept. What's your problem? Katie asked, setting down the bundle of dry limbs and grass for the campfire. Rubbing the back of his thighs and his butt, Carter replied, I drove buses. I've never ridden a horse, at least not until the Reaper's maiden told me I was coming with her. I wasn't going to say no to her. She scares the shit out of me. Katie laughed at Carter's description of Sierra as she placed grass loosely together, with the thinnest and driest facing her. Pulling a flint from the side pouch of the pack next to Sierra's horse, Katie began striking it with her knife, throwing sparks onto grass. Starting the fire reminded her of when her father had shown her to use a flint, and just how long it took to start her first fire with him standing over her shoulder watching every strike. How far is it to the FEMA camp? We should be somewhere around the city of Union by now. Katie estimated they had been riding for two full days and averaging about thirty miles a day. The question was intended to distract herself from the death of her father as tears began to form on her lower eyelid. Damn it, Katie thought, as she wiped the tears from her eyes before they could run free. Carter thought about what she had said and where they might be before saying, Maybe another day and half. Not sure my butt will be able to handle it, though. He sat up and rubbed his legs a little more. Walking from the woods carrying the coffee can, Sierra replied to Carter's comment, You'll be just fine. It gets easier the more you ride, and I think we can make it by tomorrow. Carter and Katie both were a little startled by just how easy it was for Sierra to walk into camp without them hearing a sound. Katie pretended she had known she was approaching all along, and it wasn't until just then she realized her pistol and shotgun were still with the rest of her gear. At that moment, she could even see her father showing and teaching her all she needed to know about surviving times such as these. Loudly, as if he were standing there, she heard his voice say, Now do it better than I did it. Knowing he also wouldn't want her to cry for him, Katie fought back the tears and made her way over to her weapons. She wrapped the pistol belt around her, allowing it to rest upon her hips as she focused on what needed to be done. Grasping each end of the belt, she then pulled it tight, just like she had done before every three-gun match she had entered. Checking her custom STI 9mm pistol 
and seeing that everything was working properly, she slid the magazine in and racked the receiver back, loading around in the chamber. Looking at the pistol she had often shared with her father, she said with a quivering bottom lip, I will do it better than you did, Dad. She slid the pistol in the holster, swearing to always keep it by her side. Clearing her throat and inconspicuously wiping her eyes free of tears, Katie turned back to where Sierra stood with a lighter in her hand. Bending over, Sierra struck the lighter next to the pile Katie had made for the campfire. I find lighters to be better than a flint stone. And faster, Sierra said, igniting the pile within a second. With a smile on her face, Katie nodded her head, agreeing. Better than Dad could do it. The fire burned, and crawdads boiled in the water. Sierra could not help but feel for Katie and what she had lost. Even though she had lost a great deal of family and loved ones since it all began, there was nothing as painful as losing a parent. Images of her own parents began to flood her mind, mostly of how her own dad would place his feed store hat on her head and spin her around in the yard whenever he came home. Standing up quickly, she walked over and grabbed a pair of fencing pliers from her saddlebag. Time to eat and eat fast. I want to get moving, Sierra said, refusing to think about her parents or anyone else's. Using the pliers, Sierra pulled the hot can from the fire and drained the water, leaving only cooked crawdads. It doesn't take long for them to cool. When they do, I suggest eating everything that isn't hard. Not much meat in the claws, but that little protein might keep you going. While instructing Katie and Carter about the dinner they were about to eat, she used the pliers to pull a large one from the can and let it dangle in the air for a few seconds. Feeling it was okay to touch, Sierra placed it in her hand and began to pass the pliers over to Katie to retrieve hers, only to see she was pulling one from the can with makeshift chopsticks. Carter? Carter looked closely at the alien-looking creatures staring up at him from the can. I am allergic to shellfish. Can't eat shrimp or clams. Not sure about crawdads, though. Smiling, Sierra tossed the pliers over to Carter as she commented. One way to find out. As soon as the last crawdad was removed from the can, Sierra stood and began kicking dirt on the fire. We are moving out as soon as you saddle up and the horses are watered. Sierra walked over to Big Boy and untied him from the fence running between the field and the woods where they camped. Pulling a brush from the saddlebag, she began running it down the length of his neck, with each stroke extending out far as she could reach. The time she spent with Big Boy had become the closest feeling of home she had since leaving, and now she cherished every stroke of the brush. Having moved to the other side of the large horse to apply the same amount of strokes as she did to the first, a queasy feeling started to come over her. Thoughts of the crawdads began racing, though her mind. Were they cooked long enough? What was in the can before using it to cook? Was the water poisoned? Sierra knew whatever the cause of her ill feelings. It had to be affecting the others as well. Even though she felt ill, she continued to brush Big Boy. Once finished, with the brush placed back in the saddlebag, Sierra leaned up against Big Boy as the sickening feeling grew, along with her concern for Katie and Carter. What the hell is this? she said aloud, with anguish in her voice, though nobody was around. It looks like I can eat crawdads after all, Carter announced to Sierra as he exited the woods with Katie. Hearing Carter speaking without pain, Sierra turned to face Big Boy as if she had just been stroking the horse's mane, not wanting either one to know how she was feeling. Following closely behind Carter, with her Benelli M-212 gauge shotgun slung over her back, the three-gun pistol belt around her waist, complete with the 9 millimeter and saddle in her hands, ready to ride, Katie stopped in her tracks. Looking off into the distance in what seemed to be no particular direction, Katie listened closely to the sounds around them. Throwing his saddle over the horse he had been riding, Carter saw Katie just standing there. Curious as to what would make her stop while carrying the heavy saddle, he asked, What are you doing, Kate? Quickly she snapped back, Katie, not Kate! You don't hear that? It sounds like thousands of bees heading this way. Under his breath, Carter barely made a sound as he commented, Bet she would have liked Cat. You would have bet wrong, 
Katie replied now, looking to the sky. Shocked that she had heard him when he barely heard himself, Carter stopped what he was doing and listened. I don't hear anything, he replied after a second. Katie began walking over to her horse as she responded to Carter's comment. Probably because you won't shut up long enough. Throwing her saddle over the horse, she noticed Sierra hadn't spoken or moved from where she stood on the other side of her horse, as the buzzing sound she heard grew stronger. Hearing the conversation taking place between Katie and Carter, Sierra eliminated the possibility the crawfish were to blame for the queasy, sick feeling in her gut. The pain was so intense that she could only remember one other time she had felt this way. The night her parents died. Quickly her thoughts turned to Robert, where he was, and what he was doing. Do you hear that, Sierra? she heard Katie ask. Curious as to what she was hearing, Sierra closed her eyes and tried to focus on distant sounds. At the least, she hoped it would distract her from the pain or the thoughts of what might have happened to Robert. At first, she heard nothing but a distant and very noisy whip-poor-will, but between its morning calls, she began to hear a humming noise. The more Sierra listened, the louder the noise became, and the less sick she felt. Believing whatever the noise was had something to do with the way she felt, she came to the conclusion that, no matter what it was, it couldn't be good. Saddle up! We have to move now! Sierra shouted in the most demanding voice she felt she had ever used with the two. With that order, the pain and queasy feeling all but vanished from her midsection. Following Sierra's lead, Carter and Katie worked quickly at securing everything they needed to travel. What is it? Katie asked as the sound grew louder by the second. Finished with saddling Big Boy in record time, Sierra grabbed the horn of the saddle and swung atop him before addressing the question. With the noise becoming louder, Sierra had to speak up to ensure they heard her. It sounds like planes coming in low. Wonder if there might be an airport nearby. Carter thought about where they were and the airstrips he knew of before speaking. Nothing very big. The airport in St. Louis is at least 50 miles away. The sound grew so loud that all they could do was make out words here and there while reading the other's lips. Suddenly all three looked to the sky above as a massive plane, looking much like a whale with wings, flew over the trees. It alone was not enough to startle Sierra, but seeing the large red star upon the wings of the multiple planes following closely behind did, and it helped her realize why she had the gut-wrenching pain earlier. Pointing up to the closest of them, Katie screamed, Look! A stream of soldiers began exiting the rear of the plane. Turning Big Boy toward the woods, Sierra shouted as loud as she could as she rode past the other two, We have to go now! Taking off through the woods, Sierra watched closely for movement, knowing that there was no way to know just where the soldiers might have been dropped. Dodging limbs and allowing Big Boy to determine the best path to take, Sierra looked back to ensure Carter and Katie were not far behind. Seeing Katie was close, and Carter was at least in sight, she gave Big Boy another command. Move it, boy! She slapped him just behind the saddle while holding the reins with her other hand. Without warning, Sierra felt something massive strike her as the world around her began to spin. Rolling across the ground, Sierra felt herself stop as her body wrapped around a tree, forcing the air from her lungs. Sierra! Katie screamed seeing the man drop through the treetops, swinging in midair. Quickly, she pulled back on the reins, bringing the horse to a stop and using the forward momentum to lean forward, allowing the shotgun strapped to her back to slide over her head as she guided it into her hands. Seeing the soldier pulling at his waist to retrieve his weapon, Katie took aim, switched the safety to off, and froze, unable to pull the trigger. All her life... She never believed the day would come that she would be using the skills learned for three gun competitions to take another's life. Now in front of her was a soldier clearly set on killing her first, and she could not regain control of her finger to pull the trigger. Katie watched from atop her horse with eleven shells in the tube and one in the chamber as the soldier raised his weapon to fire. Still, she could not make her finger pull the trigger. Seeing the soldier taking aim as her heart pounded away, Katie heard her father's voice. It was from a memory of him telling her to focus on the center of the white steel plates during the match and nothing else that was happening around her. 
In front of her, Katie no longer saw a man hanging from the trees with a gun pointed at her preparing to fire, but a large white steel plate. With the slight movement of her finger, she hit her target. Ha! I burned it down! She screamed, as she had done each time she cleared a course during the three gun matches. Well, if you are through burning things, you want to help me back on my horse? Sierra said, attempting to catch her breath. 